All right, so I'm gonna be completely transparent. As we start a review of the BlackBerry Key 2, I was super excited when this phone came in and, and usually I can put my exuberance or, or lack thereof, depending on which phone I'm reviewing aside, but the Quirky Key 2 got me pumped. But now after almost two weeks of using the phone, did that excitement stay? I'm John Rettinger from Techno Buffalo and this is our review of the BlackBerry Key 2. I was a pretty big fan of the Key 1. I liked the stock Android feel of BlackBerry's UI, but the keyboard was just too cramped for my taste, and the display left a lot to be desired. But man, that sweet battery life. But I am happy to report that BlackBerry fixed most of the gripes. The physical keyboard, which I promise I will talk way more about, is now 20% larger. It's actually taller, if you want to be more specific, making typing surprisingly easy. I still had like a two to three day learning curve to readjust my brain and my fingers to get used to a physical keyboard. But once I did, it was great. And the key throw is tactile enough to be satisfying, if that's a word. And this time around, the keys are matte as opposed to gloss, which aside from just looking better, drastically improved the typing experience. So cool thing about having a physical keyboard, aside from surprisingly being a really good conversation starter, is each key can essentially be a shortcut. It sounds awesome in theory, but in practice it wasn't fully baked to the last gen. You gotta be exited out of an app and on the home screen to call up a shortcut. It was still useful, but not as much as it could be. So enter the speed key, that little nine dots toward the bottom of the keyboard fixes that issue and lets you access shortcuts from any app. All you gotta do is just push it and then the key you've got assigned. And I wanna give BlackBerry credit here for listening to feedback. The keyboard is also kind of a trackpad, letting you scroll through websites, home screens, or anything else that you'd have to use a touchscreen for. It's a really nice touch. I found myself getting used to the keyboard and the functionality it provided. Granted, trying to type in numbers is sometimes tricky with the Alt key, but it's a very small compromise and one I was happy to make. BlackBerry changed a lot about the Key 2, but one thing they didn't change for the Key 1 is the display, which is kind of a bummer. Size-wise, it's still good. It's 4.5 inches. It gives you plenty of real estate. The 433 PPI and 1620 by 1080 panel just looks meh to me. Now I get some compromises had to be made to hit that 650 price tag, which I do want to mention is $100 more than the Key 1 when it launched, but color going in, it's not the strongest part of the phone. Also note, the 3.2 aspect ratio is going to take some getting used to. What BlackBerry didn't bring in the screen department, they certainly did in the RAM category. Surprisingly, this comes with six gigabytes. The key one started to really bog down for me after a few months. So I'm gonna assume the extra RAM here will help. During my two weeks, the phone felt fast and fast as any other phone, even those with a faster Snapdragon chipset. But I will be looking for slowdown as we do our longer test and do a three month later video, if you guys want. Another area that's improved is just the overall build of the phone. It's pretty awesome that BlackBerry is able to increase the keyboard size and keep the overall size of the phone the same. And there's no getting around the this feels like a brick design language, but at least no notch. So BlackBerry moved all the keys to the right side of the device this time, which is nice. And always the convenience key can be mapped to anything you want. M imagine that. Me? I just mapped it to the camera. And since I set myself up perfectly for that smooth transition, let's let's talk about the camera. It's got two on the back, which BlackBerry was super pumped to point out as a first for them. The cameras aren't really remarkable. Both are 12 megapixels with one being telephoto, giving a 2X optical zoom. Predictably, it also gives portrait mode. That's the price of entry in 2018. I'm not gonna go too much into it, but it does a pretty solid job at the bokeh blur. The rest of the pictures are unremarkable, not bad, just not amazing. Color reproduction is good, low light shows a ton of noise. If you zoom in, you're also gonna see a ton of artifacting. If you plan on replacing a DSLR with this, you'll be disappointed. And also, never do that with a phone. But if you want an average shooter, the more it is, you're gonna be fine. The front camera's eight megapixel and surprisingly gives you full manual control for everything except for autofocus. That was a nice surprise. A 3500 milliamp hour battery would be big for any phone, but when you factor in the size with a phone running a less power hungry processor and a screen that's not pushing crazy pixels, you've got something magical. Professionally, I say, holy battery. This thing lasted longer than anything else I can ever remember testing. I could easily get through two plus days of usage, which for me is unheard of, especially with my borderline phone addiction. If you want a phone with the best battery life, just get a key too and be done with it. When you eventually charge it, you can do it via USB-C and it's compatible with USB Power Delivery 2.0 and Quick Charge 3.0. Although, 
I guess I'm nitpicking here, but wireless charging would have been nice. On the software side, it's Android 8.1 based and is really close to a stock Android 1 experience. And I'll admit, I did try to make it a Pixelberry with the launcher during my last phase of testing, but I do really dig what BlackBerry's done. It did annoy me a little bit that the dock has an icon taken up by the app drawer. I just got really used to the swipe up on other phones. The productivity tab you can swipe into was also surprisingly useful. DTEC adds extra security, but honestly, if you like a stock Android feel, this phone's going to be very familiar. So the Key 2 is not a perfect phone, and it's clearly not for everyone, but I'd imagine you already know going in if this phone's going to be for you. If you do have an open mind, what you're gonna get is a productivity powerhouse, a phone that a lot of people are gonna to wanna to talk to you about, keyboard that offers a ton of shortcuts, and a phone that's overall a pleasure to use, and is going to last you for days and days, which is really rare in today's power-hungry smartphones. So the question I asked at the beginning, did the excitement wear off on the Key 2? And the answer is no, it didn't. I really enjoyed using the phone. I'm wary of that slowdown on the lag that I had with the Key 1, and again, I'll be watching for it. But if you want a phone that's going to be great for productivity, it's going to be quick for typing emails, it's going to be different than what else is out there, and do it all without having a notch, and not break your bank, BlackBerry Key 2 is a really good choice. So it reminded me of the old days, reviewing the BlackBerry again. What do you guys think about the Key 2? I'm generally curious if you would buy it. 650 bucks, while not flagship price, it's still competing with a lot of phones, and a lot of phones that are very well specced. If you're gonna pick up the Key 2, I'd love to know why. If you're skipping it, also let me know in the comments down below. And of course, all the other stuff, please, that YouTube makes us do, because I don't send notifications anymore. Subscribe and hit the bell to get notified, in theory, when new videos are coming out. We got a lot of awesome stuff coming new versus videos, new series launching. I don't want you guys to miss anything. So next time, I'm John Rettinger from Techno Buffalo.